My guest today is Neil Clark, barrister at 42 Bedford Row. Neil, we're going to be looking at your path to law, and I know we, I meet a lot of interesting people, but your story is particularly special, and I'd like you to share it with us, please. So first of all, just beginning with um, your family. You don't come from a family of lawyers, do you? No, my father was an actor, and my mum was a scene painter at York Theatre Royal. And your father, so. in fact, was, was quite well known. He was um, John Carlyle. That's right. A TV and stage actor yeah. in the 60s. So tell us a little bit about him and what so, he grew up with. Yeah, my dad was was well, he was in the army and then after the army went to RADA and then after being in RADA he started working in rep uh, in the north of England. But the first television job he had was, um, or the first major television job he had was Dr. Large in Emergency War 10, which I think was the first live hospital soap opera and he was quite a significant character in that. And um, I understand he, he was successful, made Very, quite a bit of money. Yeah, he was, well, he, he used to boast that he had more money than the Prime Minister at the time. So, but that was in the 60s, and um, he did a, another television series called New Scotland Yard, which was very big in the early 70s. And our, it was at that point um, he got slightly fed up with the rat race is when he he described it and became uh, a hippie and started uh, an alternative lifestyle. And he gave you a choice, didn't he? Well, he they made he made a decision. Where he just, what he wanted to do was set up a commune with some of his friends, actor friends, and what they decided on was to buy a big old sailing boat, sell their houses, sell their property, and just take off and explore. Um, and that's what they did. And I was very nervous about that at the time. How um, old were you? Um, I'd have been about nine then, so I remember saying I didn't want to go on a boat, I didn't want to get shipwrecked, and uh, that was my big problem, and the, uh, he used to say, when well, he said to me, you're much more likely to get run over than you are being shipwrecked, so I wouldn't worry about that. And but you did set off with him, didn't you? We did, yeah. I mean, we were given a choice whether we wanted to go to um, boarding school or, or join the boat, and... Mm -hmm. So we joined the boat. <laughs> and tell, tell me a little bit about that life on the boat. Um, so Dad was in the Sea Scouts or Sea Cadets. Sea Cadets, um, that was all the experience he had about sailing. So we hired a skipper and the skipper took us around the UK for the first six months. Or We spent quite a while in Woodbridge having the boat restored and we lived on the boat then. And he sold the house and bought the boat, a big sailing, wooden sailing boat, a bit like the Oneidin line, if you remember the Oneidin line, it was one of those kind of boats. So a lot of work, and then we slowly went around the UK learning how to sail. Um, and what about schooling? Well, we were going to be homeschooled, which lasted for about two weeks, and then my mum gave up. So we didn't have any schooling. Now when you say commune, a hippie commune, how many people were, were on this boat? It varied, but probably about nine or ten. So. That... And then from England, uh, did you sail further afield? From England we went to Amsterdam, that was the first stop, and my mum was pregnant then. So we sailed from Ramsgate to... to um, I ended up in Amsterdam, stayed there for a few months, and my brother Twig was born. And... Um, and, and these nine or ten people, were they all actors or were they different? They were a mixture. There was, well, the main, Doug was the main um, co-captain with my dad. He wasn't the captain. My dad was very much the captain, but Doug was the main contributor other than my dad and he was quite a successful American actor. Um, his boyfriend, Mel, came on. He was a hairdresser. So there was, it was creative and there was Naomi who was... Um, half Japanese from Hawaii. Um, she was, you know, uh, a, a, a close friend of the family, and a few other people that joined the commune that, uh, you know, wanted that alternative lifestyle. And did you live in Amsterdam when you when you reached there? We lived on the boat. So you we lived, lived on, on the boat. boat. Yeah, on the North Sea Canal, and that's where my brother was born. And what was your experience of Amsterdam as a young boy of about ten or eleven? Well. <laughs> There's two major. The, the red light district was quite an eye opener for an 11 year old boy that used to go out with his brother in the dinghy and take the little boat out there, and that was quite a, a vivid memory and quite exciting. Um, and then going to clubs with my parents and watching films like Easy Rider, and as a 10 year old, then so they were very exciting. 
Look, looking back now, as an adult, what do you make of that, that kind of lifestyle at that age? Um, that's quite a complicated question. I mean, it, it was, I mean, it was a gift in some ways, but it's also been a real burden for me. You know, it was very difficult to, to go, to re, um, you know, re -so be re-socialised in a different way. Well, coming back to a comprehensive school in northwest London after that, I mean, that was just the very beginning. I mean, after that, we went on and the journey... Uh, but Is that, I was going to ask you, because there came a point where the commune broke up. Yeah. And your family then set off in a different vehicle. Well, yeah, I mean, we, we, we sailed around Europe, we were in Amsterdam for a while, on Fleur, we crossed Biscay, um, incredibly seasick across Biscay, and then into the Mediterranean we went to uh, Morocco, which was amazing, uh, going to um, Tangiers, and then we were in Formentera for a while, and we spent quite a considerable time on Ibiza and Formentera, and we were preparing to go across the Atlantic to Rio. Mm -hmm. So that was the idea. I mean, there was a lot of dope smoking and LSD being taken on the boat. I mean, not by me, no, not by not me, by you, I but I was aware of it. I knew what was going on. I mean, I knew people were tripping. I knew people were smoking dope and I knew that it was illegal. But all of that was going on. But, I mean, never, the commune, the, basically there was this alternative lifestyle that was set up, um, which ruptured um, on former terror. Because half of the boat, well, Dad wanted to cross the Atlantic. He wanted to sail the boat and be a, 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 a um, wanted a big adventure and wanted to be quite macho about it. And then the other half of the of the commune wanted to go through the Greek islands and have a nice time and just chill out. Um, so there was a big bust up and the, the commune broke up. Um, but then shortly after that, well, there was new people joined. But then after that, we got shipwrecked on Formentera. So, uh, so, so your your fear really came true. My didn't fear it? came true. I was always a pessimist, <laughs> and uh, but a realist, and it did really it happen to us. We got shipwrecked. But, I mean, nobody was injured or anything. And Neil, why isn't there a film of your life I so don't far? Know. <laughs> Clearly, we, we I, have to write a script. I have thought about it, but I'm, I'm lazy. I think that, that, really that's one of the things that the, the journey, the being, is that that laziness of being a hippie kid of actually having the discipline to sit down and have the confidence to write it. But you, you went further afield than Europe and Nigeria. Yeah, af after the boat sank, um, we salvaged, there was no insurance. So Dad sold the house, uh, got, bought the boat, but the boat was so old, it was 100 years old, um, wooden sailing boat, he couldn't get insurance for it, or the insurance would be as expensive mm -hmm. as the boat. So we didn't insure the boat, lost everything. He had a little bit of savings, but not much, and so he got enough money together to buy a van, and he wasn't finished with his adventure. So he decided to head off across the Sahara Desert. So he dragged us, just the family, the, the one, one of my brothers was born in Amsterdam, Twig. So it was Twig, who was a baby, made breastfeeding, you know, tiny, us, and we were macrobiotic at that time, so it was a bag of rice, bag of almonds, bag of dried figs. Um, very little else, and then we set off across the Sahara. So you were ahead of your time with the macrobiotic diets? I, I think in the, the, that was early 70s, 74, when we were shipwrecked. So there were quite a few people doing macrobiotics then. So when you got to South Africa, I think that was the first time that you went to a, a, what we would call a proper school. Well, I was at school before in England. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, that, that was proper school after I think two year, two and a half years of not having regular and, and school. And in then. South Africa did you live uh, in the van or did you have No, no, van? we only got as far as Nigeria in the van and the van broke down by then and we managed to sell it for something. Right. And, uh, and then we got on a flight to South Africa. And, and lived in, in a normal home? And then we lived, my, my aunt um, was a journalist in South Africa, so we lived with my aunt. And then you came back to England, didn't you? In 1976. 76, yeah. And you went back to school here. Mm -hmm. And you've talked earlier about how difficult it was to re-socialise. Yeah. So, so what, what was it like? Um, it was very... Um, I mean, there was the, the many things, because Dad was unemployed after... It. Dad was a very successful actor, had a good um, uh, career. But coming back, they soon forget you, so he had about a year of unemployment. So we had no money and we were living with my parents and then going into a 
school in uh, just a state comprehensive in Wembley which was very where they were so mean I mean having been in Africa and having been on the road and this happiness and being in the sunshine there was so much positivity with people and coming back to London it felt very difficult because people were so competitive and unfriendly uh, and then not being able to I could read but not very well uh, and um, I couldn't write properly I couldn't so that was very very difficult so that that emotionally for me was incredibly uh, painful and um, yeah so I'd be, I'd be in the back, the back of the class trying to catch up with what was written on the board. During this period was there any idea in your mind that you might become a lawyer? No. So it, it no. wasn't really even part of your thinking was Not it? Not at all. Not at all. I just wanted to be normal and fit in at that time of my life. And, and sadly your, your parents then separated. Yeah. And you were left very much as a carer almost, weren't you, for your younger siblings? My, yeah, one of my brothers was born when we got back in 1976, and the other one had been born in um, 1974. Um, so they were very, they were fairly young when we came back in 1976. Um, and it was a year of my dad trying to find work, being unemployed. Then once he did get work, he was back up in the theatre and away. And I mean, th that was, it was always for my dad, the, the theatre is his first, That what he said when he, we got back, was that the theatre is his first wife and the theatre is his first family and we fit in, we have to fit in with that. And then once he got established in the theatre, and um, theatre cleared in mould, um, just didn't hear from him. And mum was struggling to bring us up, you know, changing nappies and everything. Uh, and that was very, so at that point I was very hands on helping out but um, but also being a teenage boy growing up doing all the things that you, you try to survive in school and, and have a good time as well but um, yeah so I was very hands on and they did split up when I was 15 so by the time I was 15 yeah. Did you get any qualifications from school? Three A levels. And, and where did that land you? Um, well I, I went to drama school where you didn't need academic qualifications no, so school, I was at Guildhall and then you same, I was in the same year as Simon Russell Beale and you know, so you were competing with people like Simon Russell Beale as an actor which was a real education so three years that was that was my education well, the one that, that was well it wasn't my education but it was your you put you on your metal having to sort of interact with people like that and, and then how did you fare as an actor? Because you, your father obviously had been successful on stage and in TV. I was more of a sort of bumbling along, sort of uh, one wanted to be... Uh, um, I mean, I did lots of television and theatre. I was at the National for a year. I was in EastEnders for a year. So I did, I did lots of stuff, but I was never driven as an actor. Mm -hmm. I always felt I wanted to be part of the ensemble. I wanted to be at the you know, National Theatre. I wanted to do Shakespeare mm -hmm. as a company player and, and well, or to share in the theatre, the theatre, the, the storytelling experience. Or, you know, but but I, it, it's, I was never really driven. But I've got to be successful, and I think you need that as an actor. So from that background and that theatrical love, how on earth did you get into law? Well, um, I mean, acting is really difficult, so it's pretty soul-destroying, and I have got to a point after doing East End, or actually, you know, it was before. I mean, I went through a fairly break, big breakdown in my own personal life, or a, a crisis point where I thought I can't carry on. I was doing too much painting and decorating between acting jobs, too much other jobs that were just not making me were making me very unhappy. So I went into therapy so for quite quite a while. And it was through that that actually I, I realised I have value as an individual. I'm not an actor. I don't have to be successful as an actor. I've got my own and it was that that I thought from there I went in and thought, well, I need an education because three O levels just isn't good enough. Um, I'm not that, I'm more than that. So I did Open University Social Sciences and then all of a sudden I could, with computers I could spell or spell check would help me spell and my results were good. So, and that, and that was, ah. so then I did a law degree after that and uh, a Burke pack. And um, then came to the bar. And then I kept, well, it wasn't until the final year of Burke pack where I was getting on course for a first 
But I thought, what do I want to do with my law degree? Because I wasn't thinking about being a lawyer. I was just thinking it would be a good degree to get, you know, to open doors for employment and do something. You know. So that's why I did the law degree. But I loved it. And then I thought, well, actually, acting is not that dissimilar from being a barrister. I'm used to getting on stage and, and, uh, and standing up and speaking. Um, so that's why I thought, well, I can give it a go. So I came and auditioned for a few sets of chambers and got very lucky with 42 Bedford Road. And it's so. been absolutely brilliant speaking to you, Neil. I'm sure that uh, we'll get a huge response to this and there may be a second part. Okay. Thank you so much. That's